Hello and welcome back inside the park for mayor for podcast number 838, the Monaco Grand Prix review. This is Todd. No, Todd, not now. AKA Negative Camber. You know why I've asked you here. You must convince the villagers that I'm harmless. That's what I need you to do. You know what we do on race view, review weekends, don't you? We watch one, then we talk about it. Then we watch one, then we talk about it. Come on, Todd. That's exactly what we do on race weekends. But before doing that, I have to introduce my co-host, and you know what that means means yep i gotta go find a an actual wrecked from out of the wasteland an actual race car driver beautiful he's crazy it's hello everybody this is paul charles the the international how you doing paul i'm good been a full racing day already hasn't it i know you and i we watched a lot of racing today lots of racing yeah got up early watched monaco then we, you know, sat through the uh, Indy 500. Big congratulations to yep. uh, the captain and Tim Sendrick. Yeah, good for him. Class yeah, I wore my, Mc, my, my McLaren, McLaren shirt today because I was pulling for Zach yeah. at Indy. Yeah. I at didn't Indy. have much hope for him in Monaco, but yeah. I, thought, I thought he had a good shot at, at Indy, and I know Indy means a lot yeah, to, to Zach, uh, yeah. which is why he was there, not Monaco, right? But uh, yeah. uh, it's crying shame. But yeah, it was a, an eventful Indy 500 as well, wasn't it? So yeah, yeah, I was really confused. Uh, you know, the, I mean, I like Joseph Newgarden, and it's great that he finally mm-hmm. won it. You know, that was great. And yeah. uh, uh, and as I said, I've as most of the longtime listeners know, I've met. Uh, Roger and interviewed him and and Tim Sendrick a couple times when I did the double and they're yep. a class operation. They're wonderful people, and so yeah. I have nothing against that. I think that's great. I'm super happy for him. I do find myself agreeing a little bit with Marcus Erickson because mm. going from the pit lane out to immediately a green flag seems very unorthodox to me. And if yes. that would have changed and happened in Formula One, there would have been lawsuits. There would have been <laughs> yeah. all kinds of protests. Yeah. I mean, it would have gotten really litigious if they'd yeah. have done that. So I'm not quite sure if that's because no. I don't know the Indy regulations. Can you just ad hoc make that change? Is that an option in the regulations? I don't know. But that if I was Marcus, I'd be a little torqued about that. I, I would be. I mean, it was, you know, I think they had a couple of missteps there when they when they didn't throw the red immediately. Mm-hmm. They could have done that and they would have had an extra lap to play with, which I think would have been right. very valuable. Then plodding around a pace car speed for a couple laps before they stopped the race right there at the end. Yeah, it was wasted laps. Right. And and I agree. You don't. You, I mean, yes. I mean, but Nowadays, that's what everyone's want, right? What is this? What you want? Yeah, they right. always want the drama and everything happening on the last lap, and and you know, I I can understand that for the fair weather fan, I suppose, but yeah. for the people that are in it from in deep, looking at strategy and and how to get to a race and how to run a car and you know develop a car for a race and everything, and it would all to be thrown out just for a a crapshoot the uh, the end. You know, it's it's a bit tough but yeah um, you do sure always want to re- finish a race under green i get it but. yeah i get it but if you're gonna you know make a departure from the standard yeah. procedure I'm, I'm sure chip ganassi is not very happy tonight yeah yeah and and, and obviously yeah the tire warm-up thing that he said that ericsson said is also an issue right you're you're yeah. dicing with uh a lot of machinery out there with a lot of money and lives and we saw you know a couple of close calls there indy this yeah, year yeah. so we know things can happen pretty quick yeah yeah so let us know if uh, any of you watched the indy 500 what you thought of that but we're going to talk about the monaco grand prix because that's what we do let's start off with our formation lap and just set the table here much has been said over the past few years about how boring and processional the monaco grand prix and why many folks you know believe it shouldn't be on the schedule and i look i get that i've sat through you know having watched this formula one as long as i have I have sat through a lot of processional Monaco Grand Prix in my day. Mm -hmm. I understand the point, uh, but I completely disagree with it. Um, If there's one track to me that moves the pendulum away from the car and towards the driver, it's Monaco. And I love to see these cars kind of neutered from the aero and just really down to mechanical grip and in the driver's hands and then you it really does separate the herd pretty quick you know it's it's narrow twisty streets means it puts a lot of pressure on the qualifying session so it makes saturday a huge event because um and wasn't it 
Yeah. Yeah. What a qualifying we had this yeah. weekend. We got to see a master class in epic qualifying performance from Fernando, Max and Esteban, all three of them doing an inhuman job of taking one, two, three. Well, Esteban four, but he inherits three after Leclerc. And, you know, that grid was um, an amazing qualifying session. So the race itself was you know equally exciting had a lot of head scratching strategy to figure out with aston martin trying to force red bull's hand and then the late race rain um that was a complete injection of chaos into this race but mm -hmm. um you know and it was fair to say paul that there was some nice passing even before the rain got there um i think of magnuson's move on sergeant down at mirabeau you know and yep. snuck into there and sort of duped him and i thought that was a good pass mm -hmm. Um, this track severely punishes even the slightest of mental relapses. And Paul and I have talked about that a lot in the past. And it makes the race such a driver focus event. And I love that. The talk of changing the track to favor modern era cars makes me sad because I, you know, we already got a Saudi. We already got a Singapore, those kind of things. We need Monaco to mm -hmm. act as a special feature that reduces the car performance, sort of neuters some of that impact and favors a more driver focused experience where the driver can make it or break it in just fractions of a, of a millimeter. And so yeah. as we saw all weekend, Paul, even during qualifying, saw all those guys rubbing the walls. A couple took it too deep, but most of them were all just, you know, ripping the hoardings Sergio. off the armco. <laughs> Sergio, yes, yeah. is one of them, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Al Alex Albon, another. But yeah. Yeah, and, and this is part of the reason that I love Monaco. I just always have uh, because I think it's just a driver's – it's just a master class in driving. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's, a, it's a master class in focus, in, in daring, um, in, in putting – using all your skills you've developed over the years, you know, and have to bring those skills at every turn for a multitude of laps and for qualifying, which I thought – was one of the best qualifyings I've ever seen in my life. I, I just I just loved it. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, things you could see on TV and even the you know the I, I was this I was watching and listening with Alec Manish on the F1 TV one. Yeah. So I wasn't and then it was like I think we all like took a breath in when we saw Leclerc go into the on the exit of the swimming pool, just absolutely perfected the corner and we yeah. saw some other drives from alonzo just taking you know everything in his hands and just kicking butt. i mean it's it's such an acute um astonishing amount of guile and and bravery and skill and precision to to actually do one lap around there and to see them doing multiple laps is stunning but the but the qualifying just blew my doors off really it was it was yeah. the height of i was like i don't really care how the race goes I, that was, was the same it was worth it just to see the qualifying because i yeah. think you know if there's a, a, any qualifying session that that everyone should watch it should be that one and hopefully everyone did see that because yeah it, it really led into how crucial what everyone did in qualifying led to how they actually ended up in the race right um more than any other and, and they always say that but it's it really really played into the hands of the of the skilled and the people that really got everything out of their car and themselves in that qualifying session it right. paid dividends in the race it did you know and you know that you're watching things like that last lap last sector from max that last sector was just epic yeah. you know yeah i mean we, we've um, seen we've seen the lap with senna and where he was in another world and i still don't think anyone's done a lap like that in their life but um yeah there was a lot of visions of those kind of skills and that kind of mentality when they're out there in the qualifying sessions. Yeah. I mean, driving on the street course is, it really separates a lot of drivers because mm -hmm. you can be pretty flamboyant on most of the tracks um, because you've got a lot of runoff, even if you're going to get a time track minus penalty, whatever, you can just kind of throw it out there. Okay, it didn't work this time. Uh, Monaco, you, there isn't, if it doesn't work, then you, you're taking the car back on a hook. Right, mm -hmm. and everyone's looking underneath the car, all your special <laughs> aerodynamics pieces. Yeah. Um, and it's it's they they also take a lot of time. The the teams don't necessarily develop the cars very much as they develop the driver over the weekend. You've got to give them the laps. You've got to give them a comfortable car to drive. You've got to give them a car that is not understeering too much, not oversteering in the wrong points. You know, has that mid corner speed. We were, mm -hmm. you were asking me some questions before. Um, what do you want in a in a in a 
street race Formula One car. It's basically you want a little bit of understeer at the turn in, and you can so you can have a little more comfortability in getting the car into the corner. Even if you turn a little early, you know the understeer is just going to kick in a little bit, and you can make you more precise. But you really want that mid corner speed. You want to get mm-hmm. the car turned in, really have the car just glued to the track in that mid corner, which is what I saying I saw from Charles Leclerc in that in the uh, swimming pool exit on his lap. Even though it wasn't a pole lap, it was still obviously everyone was with a tenth in that top four. Right. Uh, and then you want a car that's going to be neutral to a little, maybe a slight understeer, but neutral on the exit, so you can be confident in getting out. You don't want too much understeer because then you don't want to have to be adjusting the throttle on the exit. You want that mid corner speed and get that momentum coming off. So you want slight understeer, I'd say, on the entry. Mid corner, just the car completely neutral, a neutral to maybe just a little bit. It can be a little bit understeer, oversteer, depending on what the driver wants on the exit. But you really want that straight line and be able to get on the gas and stay on the gas on the mm-hmm. exit. Yeah, it was interesting. Um, I think it was was it Friday practice or Saturday practice. Anyway, Martin was down at the Newville Chicane. Yeah, and when he goes around the corners, different corners, he was down at Newville chicane and uh he was watching and it was real close you know and they had the camera on all the cars and he was pointing out the the fact that they were all using that curb to rotate the car yeah you know and they would all come in there and the right rear was coming off the ground but they launched that right rear just over that curve red and white curb yeah. and the right rear would come off and then the car would slide in and Jump. rotate yep yeah yeah. yeah. And uh, they were all doing that consistently. It was such a cool camera angle. And so I thought that was that was pretty cool. And then you and I were uh, kind of texting back and forth. And I was mm-hmm. asking you about that because I, I know that Max like a, a really pointy car. You yeah. Know, so he doesn't like understeer at all. And, right. and then at Monaco, though, as I was asking you, you know, but you don't want to snap over steer here because no. that's a killer. You know, yeah. and so as you were saying, it's it's about having that understeer, a slight understeer, and the only way I could put my head around it being not being a professional driver was that that slight understeer gives you a little bit of time to wait on the rear, mm-hmm. um, and so we're not, you know, flipping or spinning that car. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's a, a great point. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about Red Bull up front. Uh, you've got Sergio Perez uh, in P16, Max Verstappen P1 takes the victory after a terrific qualifying effort. Max started on mediums, and that may have given the team a bit to, of relief, knowing that Alonso was going to be on the hard. So making that start, Max was going to have a little more grip on that softer tire. But on the flip side of that, relief would also have been accompanied by a serious strategy concern as the hard compound shot Alonso was going to go it was really going to force Red Bull's strategy in yep. at that point. So Red Bull looked at it and said, okay, well, they've got hards. They're going to run long if they get a safety car. There's a lot of things going to happen here that really puts us on the back foot. And so at this point, they were just going to have to go uh, uh, long, you know, on, mm-hmm. a, on a set of mediums, which, you know, we knew were graining and, and wearing. Max managed that gap just to cover sort of that uh, a, a possible safety car. So he pulled out a gap uh, because they knew they were going to have to go long and the team were watching the radar and advising if possible for Max to stay out as long as possible. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you could, there was reports that rain might be moving in, uh, how heavy it was going to be. Nobody really knew. Um, they didn't expect it to be too heavy. Uh, McLaren said it was class one rain. Um, so, you know, they were watching that, but they kept saying, you know, Max would radio and say, these mediums are pretty much toast. This is, Mm -hmm. you know, they were like, Max, you box, you know, Alonzo wins. So, you know, the score, if possible, stay out as long as possible. And he did the strategy worked to treat as the rain came on lap, what, 52, 53 ish. And this allowed Max to stop for inners and then go on to take the win. Um, but I think if I think you have to also give some props to how well he drove in the rain and managed those initial wet laps on the slicks. Yeah, tricky. Worn mediums, right? Mm-hmm. Extremely worn mediums, and um, and make that work. And he finished uh, roughly a half a minute ahead of the rest of the field, uh, which I think is and look. You know, I, I get it. There's a lot of detractors, a lot of folks that don't like Max, but the reality of it is I think you have to, you know, you have to at least appreciate the drive you put in on Saturday and Sunday. 
uh, to take that win and and to execute that strategy because otherwise I do think I do think Christian Horner's right. I think they they got off the hook there with mm-hmm. Aston Martin's call. We'll get into that next, but uh, anyway, a great race for Max. Yeah, no, it was, and as you said, they they they, they saw the differential in the tires. So for them, it was at least they had that decision. They could sort that out pretty quickly and have a plan. Um, when we we could see the pace that Max was running once we saw. Perez come in pretty quickly and then got out in clean air how much faster Perez was. So that's how much Mm -hmm. Max was managing that medium tire. I mean, trying to go as slow as he could to stay in front technically. And then, so him and Alonso were kind of playing that waiting game, you know, who's going to blink first. And and I'm sure Alonso was hoping those mediums would go away, but um, we know the Red Bull's a great car and, and, and Max is a great driver. So they were able to take care of them miraculously 10 laps over what Pirelli were predicting but I think yeah. you know you hear this squawks from the drivers on the on the tire oh this tire's done etc it's, it's still about that graining period mm-hmm. and if you can get through that you can then kind of manage it Max even said it at the um at the end of the end of the race in the interview he was talking about that where you know he got through a pretty scary phase in the tire and then it kind of leveled off and came back yeah. a little bit it wasn't miraculous but it came back enough where he where the pace of him and the, him and the Red Bull together was able to to keep that gap and yeah they they came in they made the one one pit stop for the Inters rather than what uh, the Aston team did and and took care of business so yeah qualifying I think that was for his hardest qualifying he's he's done for quite a while at this point um, because he did have all those other cars on uh, three other manufacturers on his heels in qualifying so I think that was a max factor right there pulling yeah. that out in that last sector. Um, and yeah, it, it just allowed him to control the race. It could have gone wrong. Um, but, um, uh, ultimately, you know, it's the medium call. I thought just overall, it was, is a good call for people at the back of the pack, mm-hmm. which some people did, which I was actually surprised at. Um, because if something happens at the beginning of the race, you can come in, get hards on, you can run the rest of the race. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think I was, I was surprised that people all the way at the back were still calling on hard parts but um yeah i mean flawless effort he it, it, when he got slick that was tough in those mediums i'm sure they were a bit more wore down than the hards you know once you get in that water the tires cool down because there's so little rubble left in you know you, you really it's it's probably worse on the mediums than anything than than the hards even like for like laps so um even though it's a softer tire so uh yeah he, he made a little error but as max has tended to do the little errors don't cost him a lot, right? Yeah. He gets he gets away with it, or has the skill to manage the error and and keep moving on, rather than just ended up in a barrier. So, yeah, it was a fantastic job by Max to manage. Yeah, he may not be everyone's favorite person, but how many races he got now? Thirty yeah. nine wins. Right. You know, everyone said Michael Schumacher's um, record wasn't achievable. Lewis beat that. Yeah. Um, I'll say to you that at this point. You know, watch out, Lewis, because Max has a lot of years left in. As long as he doesn't get bored. You know? Yeah, right. He gets bored. <laughs> right? he's, he's out of here. Yeah, he gets bored it's, easy by by, yeah. by leave. But, but yeah, it's his he's on a trajectory that's going to be challenged. Both those guys in in race wins if he keeps doing what he's doing and the team keep doing what they do. Yeah, no doubt. And you know, we've talked about in the past. You've talked at length about uh, what wet races and wet weather driving, mm-hmm. and about how you're hunting for. You know, every lap you're trying to find grip offline and trying to find a new line that has more grip. And that can change every lap, you know, even within the same corner. And um, and I just was thinking, Paul, as I was watching him go around on those very worn mediums about how difficult it's got to be to try to find grip offline because at this narrow of a street circuit there's not much tarmac <laughs> offline yeah. you know and it's kind yeah. of hard to find but there's uh, a lot of marbles offline though so it does help i mean there really is yeah. just one line it it is and it isn't the the thing is the offline is also right up against the Alco barrier too so yeah right yeah right. so that it's a treacherous and yeah r- the driving conditions are tough even if you've got rain tires on but um yeah you're as i've said to people before when i'm coaching people it's like if you if you're racing in the rain you have to remember what you just saw because you in two minutes time it's going to change mm-hmm. and so you've got to make a decision what you think that corner is going to be next time as you leave it you've got to put that in your memory bank and then bring that memory back up 
before you approach the corner again to yeah. try and maximize it. And you've got to see how the track evolves. That's why sometimes someone who has track history and driven a track, they know how track drives and, and that kind of thing. Right. It can be an advantage, right? But you're really predicting the future by using your experience. Right, right, exactly. Uh, let's see. Speaking of Perez. You like my face? You like it? Mm. Not particularly. Uh, not, not particularly. Gosh, Perez, you know, he had just finished a race where everybody was calling him the street king. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> mm. And in fairness, you know, the first time I ever saw his first season in Formula One and they got to Monaco and his race in Monaco was unbelievable. He crashed. Mm -hmm. at Newville, but it was an incredible performance in a Sauber. And I am stunned at what happened this weekend for him. Yeah. Um, he choked his weekend to death, basically, on Saturday with the crash and qualifying, put him at the back. It's done and dusted at that point. Then he had a few clashes during the race, you know, breaking wings and he had stop, mm -hmm. prompting three stops to, and, and finished P16. Even to the point, Paul, was in back and they used him as a test mule for full wets just yeah. to make sure, you know, if they needed to go with Max on full wets. So um, he entered this weekend just 14 points behind Max. He leaves 39 points down. So this is a really, really damaging weekend for him on a track that everyone would have said the Street King would have excelled at. So yeah. he's got to be kicking himself. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's it's hard to contemplate why he made that mistake. It just had to be some kind of lack of focus for that millisecond because he wasn't under pressure in Q1. He was going to get through in that car he's driving. There was no pressure to push push out a lap, and that error was unforgivable, really. Well, I didn't um, see a lockup, and the no, speed he, he just, took into Saint Devote was way too much. Yeah, obviously yeah, I mean, Alex Albon just just barely, right? You know, he scrubbed speed off. I don't know how Sergio reckoned he know. could carry that much speed in, but I don't know. He just got a little offline, just sent him out. It was a yeah really bad error um but you also don't want to compound your error by making lots and lots of other errors e even though he started the back yeah and once he got through a few of those cars um and he was released he still could have got some points yeah right um so you know there was no need for him to keep pushing and making errors if he, he may have finished eighth or whatever but he still would have finished in the points and so yeah. he kind of compounded his error by making more and and just yeah it was it was a he just needs to walk away from this weekend and completely forget yeah. about it because it was it was not sergio's best by any means and i'm sure red bull were, weren't too happy either yeah yeah it was really really tough um let's talk about uh aston martin shall we no more radio the rest of the race and Fernando Alonso, uh, P2 with Lance Stroll at DNF. Fernando had a good start. Uh, he was on the hard compounds, and that was an interesting move to force Red Bull's hand on strategy, which I mentioned earlier. There was a time, I you know, and maybe it's just me, uh, but there was a time during the race where, you know, Max had like 11 seconds over him. Mm -hmm. But that crept down to like six or seven. And I, I was that was when they were getting me about traffic, though, right? Yeah, yeah, it was. And I was thinking at that point in time that if he boxed, mm -hmm. I thought Max was in trouble here. I know? agree. Yeah. And I was shouting uh, at the screen. <laughs> yeah. And I was yeah. thinking, you know, this this might be a, a situation. And I think it kind of froze Max at that time. Because, you know, Red Bull or, you know, Hannah's super smart and that whole strategy team super smart. They would have known we're down to like seven seconds. If they do mm -hmm. something, we're frozen. We've got to go long here. And so in terms of strategy, I thought it, it was going to force him to go long uh, as or as long as Fernando went. Uh, but on medium compounds instead of the hards, which was not going to be easy for Max to do. And this yeah. is what Aston Martin, I think, were hoping to mm -hmm. give them the edge, right? And I thought it looked like it might possibly be playing out that way. Um, however, uh, for a time, I, I thought it might be, um, it might have worked. Yeah. Uh, but um, then 50, 50 laps, around 50 laps into the race, the rain began spitting at Mirabeau. 
Mm-hmm. And it looked as if I thought, just like the team, I kind of thought in the beginning, pretty light. It's more spitting rain in that corner. And I thought, you know, this could be kind of localized. Um, and maybe that was going to be okay. Uh, so, but the team opted to bring him in for a fresh set of mediums, thinking that it may not get heavier. Unfortunately, that didn't work because the rain did get quite a bit heavier. Yeah. It covered most of the circuit. And they had to stop again for enters. Now, you could argue, certainly that was a bad call. And I'm not quite sure, as I said earlier, I'm not quite sure they had Max completely covered at that point. But the point is that they had they boxed for enters, they most likely would have made this a whole different race. He probably would have come out a second or two behind Max, start putting a lot of pressure on. Uh, it may have worked. Now, Mike Crack later said that it, you know, yes, as soon as he passed the pit entrance, they realized they made the wrong call. Mm-hmm. Um, and he knew that, but he said, regardless, it, we wouldn't, have, we wouldn't have got by him anyway. Um, yeah. And yeah. so who knows? Well, but... Yeah. I don't, I don't, I mean, that's a, that's a great way to leave, leave, leave the weekend, but I, I don't, I don't rightly agree with it. I mean, I think they made, First off, as you said rightly, when they were approaching that traffic, Max was stuck in traffic. He was even squawking about it. I'm losing a lot of time here. Mm-hmm. As soon as Alonso got that traffic, he was actually clear of, I think, whoever third place was by that yes. point. He yeah. could have got in and out right. before losing a position, um, which was crucial. I was you're watching that 20-second gap. If he yeah. had to come in then and committed to the medium, which they committed to and then had to backtrack on, then he could have then closed, reclosed up on Max and put the pressure on Max. When Max was going to have to make a pit stop, he was absolutely going to be behind Fernando, yeah. right? Um, and then, but they didn't do that, so they waited out. And when they waited out, and then they came in the pit at a crucial time, they went to mediums again, which was, I, th- I thought, a boneheaded move. I mean, I don't, I, I really don't understand it because I, I get they were th- rolling the dice, but they didn't have to roll the dice that hard. They were really. The percentages of that working were much lower than him pitting for inters and it working out just fine. And right. they, they, first off, he was on hards and Max was on, you know, more wore out mediums. They didn't have to pit that lap either to come in and, and make that decision. They weren't being forced to make key. that decision on that lap. They didn't right? have to. They didn't have to box on that lap. They didn't have to, and they could have given themselves another lap to make a more evaluation because the things were changing by by the second. Yeah, right. If they'd have waited one more lap, they would have made the right decision, hopefully. And then, yes, the pressure would really have been on Max. I feel because um, Max, if Max wasn't going to pit till Fernando pitted, and when when Fernando pitted, then Max would have been, as we saw on the on the slicks out in the rain. You put the pressure on Max Verstappen at that point, knowing he's got to get back to the pit lane as quickly as can. Fernando's now on intermediates out there screaming around and catching you up. That forces teams into mistakes, could force Max into mistake, could force the pit crew into mistake. You've got to put the pressure on. When you don't put the pressure on, teams can relax and just get on with their business. And yes, maybe he wouldn't have been able to pass Max. But you don't know what the pressure would have done to that team and that car right. in the race, right? You try if you're behind and you don't really have the pace or anything to get by them, they try to do something different to make them put pressure on them to make a mistake, and then that makes it a little easier to to make up the position, right? It's not yeah. always won by just outperforming someone. Sometimes you make them make an error that allows you to win. Yeah, I think, and and correct me where I got this wrong, Paul, but I think if you look at the entirety of their strategy for Fernando in aggregate over the race, Mm -hmm. there was that window of time where the undercut probably would have really paid dividends had they boxed when he had enough to clear and not lose a position, right? Then if he had a box then for mediums, that undercut may have paid dividends. Mm -hmm. Then on the converse, I don't know. I mean, the question of, well, they should have just put intermediates on. Yes, of course, in hindsight, but I don't think that's the issue. I think the two issues are when they had the gap to box and go for the undercut, that was the first question I had. Mm -hmm. The second question is, is why did they box when they actually did when they could have waited a lap or two because Max is only going to lose time on that worn medium had it stayed dry. Yeah. And they didn't really need to box them, but by boxing then that put them under pressure and they made the wrong call on the tire. And then, you know, uh, Bob's your uncle, but, your uncle. Yeah, I don't. Mm-hmm. I don't know that. 
I think for me, that's two questions. Earlier, when they tr could have tried the undercut to put pressure, and second, waiting a lap or two and and sort of, you know, shadowing what Max was going to do and see what the rain was going to do, yeah. that would have left them there thereabouts. Um, yeah. At least and who closer. knows what can happen, and who knows what yeah. can happen at that point. That's yeah. my point. Because at the end of the day, Max ends up uh, about a half a minute ahead, where I think yeah. he, he may have ended up a couple, two, three seconds ahead. Who knows? Uh, yeah. But but being two or three seconds on a wet Monaco, is, to your point, is pressure time. Mm -hmm. And we know Fernando likes to apply pressure. Yeah. And yeah. we know he I knows mean, how to. <laughs> I mean, uh, he's, he's been phenomenal, yeah, Alonso. Holy is. cow. Just well, to, to that point, it's his fifth podium in six races, Paul. Yeah. it's um, Great result. Um, yeah. And this is the one track he felt like he had a real shot at winning. Yeah, I think um, he was giving everything he could because he, he did was. think that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he was, and I think he felt like he, this is the one that we could actually win at. And I think he's, I think he's right. Um, conversely, on the other side of the grid, Lance ping ponged his way around the circuit. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, I got nothing against Lance, but I will. I'm just. Let me ask you a meta metaphorical question. I got nothing against Lance. But I think the team has to be looking at the the progress of the season so far. Yeah. The performance is five podiums out of six races versus a, a DNF and no points, right? Yeah. I think Alonso is starting to expose the real delta between the two drivers. Yeah. And I think from a team's perspective – if you feel like Lance can get there, it can be coached, Fernando, you know, all those sort of things. But somewhere in the back of your head, you're going to be thinking, we're leaving a hell of a lot of points on the table. Yeah, yeah. It's too late to to, yeah. to bring those back. And and Lance has his moments. That's the he difficult does. question, right? Some, it is. Sometimes Lance is quick, and sometimes he he's close. Sometimes he he's not, and sometimes he makes big errors, right? Mm -hmm. um, so... And obviously his dad owning the team kind of helps out, yeah. you know, erase some of those errors and, 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 you know, bring up, oh, well, Lance was here and he was on pace here and there. So yeah. if, if you're looking at it from just a team with no family ties, everything, yeah, you'd think, you'd think Lance was on his last legs really. Cause yeah, that they, they finally got a car with yeah. tremendous pace that they're not able to maximize all the points they could theoretically end up second in manufacturer's points if they had someone at least close to right behind Alonso, mm -hmm. you know, the same thing like Perez behind uh, Verstappen, you know, that, that would be the goal that, you know, you're bringing in a Hulkenberg or something. I know he's on another team now, but that, that would be the type of person yeah. you'd want to bring in to, you know, make the most of the car that you designed. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think yeah. as a Lance can do it on occasion. He just, he's just not, can't do it consistently and certain tracks, certain conditions. Um, he just, he just doesn't thrive in. Um, we yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. So, he does real well, you know, in changing conditions. I've seen some great races out of it. And I'm not trying to take the Mick, you know, here. I, I like Lance. And to your point, he's put in some really good performance. that made both of us go, dang, that was yeah. really good. You know? Yeah. Um, but also, I kind of find that he can just be mentally just kind of disengaged from it. Yeah, you know, maybe when it, when it goes bad, it he th he can't recover from that. And I yeah. think you know that bad qualifying that he did. Yeah. You know, Alonso's there fighting for pole, and he's way off the mark, right? Yeah. I think being that mired down, I think he probably did switch off because he saw no hope, and then and then he got a bit desperate on making a couple of moves that then just sent him even further back. Yeah, I think there's drivers up and down that grid that can maximize that car. The car with Alonzo in second, okay, maybe mm -hmm. he's one of the greatest, you know, arguably. Um, yeah. Okay, so maybe he wouldn't got third, but he could have four, fifth, six, right? Yeah. Um, and those points are critical for this team that's spending the kind of money they are on their yeah. operation. And they are. And, they're, they're escalating that team to a different level. Yeah. I wasn't expecting them to be able to, but it's really yeah. paying dividends, so it's very impressive. I mean, I think a guy like Botas 
would do mm-hmm. a lot better for you uh, if you've got a car capable of second place in Monaco. I yeah. think a guy like Hulk, a guy like Magnuson, you know, I'd even argue Alex Albon might deliver more points at this point. Right. Uh, you know, with his race craft. So I, you know, I just, like I said, I'm not picking on Lance or anything. I'm sure he's a delightful guy. He seems like a really nice guy. I just, I just think the team's leaving a lot of points on that yeah. table and the team has to do a little introspection. And if Lawrence wants to be bullish and hang Lance out there, then he can't be upset with the lack of points. Yeah. Because Lonzo's delivering what he can, you know. Um, let's talk about, Alpine. Yeah, let's talk about Alpine, shall we? Alpine, coming off a scathing criticism from their CEO, <laughs> uh, Pierre Gasly, P7, Esteban, SD to the bestie, uh, Esteban Ocon, P3. Esteban threw down a very strong marker on Saturday. <laughs> yeah. Right? Man, I don't know where he pulled that from. That I don't know. We, you know. For all the right reasons, we talk about an epic performance from Alonso in qualifying, mm-hmm. a masterclass from him and Max. Max, yep. how he pulled out last lap, last sector is unearthly, right? Mm-hmm. I would argue, and I know you would too, that I think Esteban did exactly the same thing. Absolutely. I think, I think his lap in that car, inferior to both the Aston Martin and Red Bull, to pull mm-hmm. up in fourth behind a Ferrari of Charles Leclerc, yep. I think that was an epic performance. So he had that inherited third with Leclerc's penalty, a fantastic result for him. Esteban tried to get Alonso at the start, couldn't, uh, settled in, got punted by Carlos Sainz, but held Sainz off, right? Yeah, yeah. Which was crucial. Uh, and there was no damage to the car. Set about covering Lewis at that point, right? Going to hold the, the Mercedes off in the waning laps and a terrific podium. You know, he did, It'll. I could argue, and we'll talk about Mercedes next, about George Russell, because I think George Russell had the podium mm. uh, at that point. But, Hung in there, a great race for him, uh, a great result. He was super pumped to be on the podium. Yeah, uh, Olivia he was Pandy. exhausted too. He was, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah, yeah. You, you you don't think these guys are athletes, but they're by far very yeah. fine-tuned athletes. But Ocon threw everything out there he did. in that race, and you could see just him raising his hands. He was like, yeah, I couldn't go another lap. You know? <laughs> he did the whole Nigel Mansell where he had to be held <laughs> yeah. up during the, the ceremony, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, it was a great race for him. I, I think, uh, Crofty said, uh, what Olivier Penny was the last uh, Frenchman to stand on the podium there. Um, in 96, but anyway, uh, and then conversely, I, you know, Pierre didn't have a bad race. He ends up finishing P seven. Both yeah. cars are in the points. He just got stuck in that Ferrari sandwich. And you get in that Ferrari stage in Monaco, it's very tough to make anything really happen from there. Uh, yep. So it was a good race for him. The strategy doesn't quite play out for him like it did Esteban. Um, and, you know, you could argue that was down to Esteban, you know, starting third. Uh, right. Yeah. To, Qualifying so, was super yeah. important. Yeah, yeah. I think critical uh, to that team. Yeah. I think for Alpine, they were, they're very happy going yeah. home with peace, P3 for Ocon and still very happy that what Gasly achieved too. Yeah, I agree. Um, as you say, not that. There wasn't a lot of attrition in this race, and yeah. uh, so everyone was fighting for every position the whole for the whole race. There was no no gimme, so it was hard to make a lot of headway yeah. um, anywhere, especially you know as you say fighting with the Ferraris. But I think Gasly did a did a good job, and Ocon just did a phenomenal job in holding off the Ferraris and and keeping pace and not making a mistake. And he was under pressure from behind most of the time. Yeah, agreed. Well, let's talk about uh, Lewis, shall we? Peter Lewis. Mercedes. Uh, Mercedes, uh, Lewis Hamilton, P4, uh, George Russell, P5. George had a shot, in my mind, at the podium as he went long on those hards and then you know, only needed to change the inners, and they did. Mm-hmm. So he was set up. He was ahead of Ocon at that point. Then he ran wide. Was it down at Mirabeau? Uh, and then he clashed with Perez coming back on track, and got that five second penalty. As yeah. such, he was clearly not happy. Um, but that allowed uh, Perez, that allowed Ocon, and everybody to get through. And mm-hmm. at that point, not happy with himself. So then he set about asking the team multiple times, hey, uh, why don't you let me buy Lewis and then I can absorb <laughs> that five second penalty? I won't go more than five seconds ahead of Lewis, meaning I can yeah. easily get five seconds ahead of Lewis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. On that yeah. last lap. Yeah, yeah, on the last lap. yeah I'll, I'll get five seconds. I won't go anymore. And that'll absorb my podium. They were like, yeah, well, pace is good. You're six seconds ahead yeah. of Leclerc. And then Sweet later. Yeah, hot shot. Yeah, then later he came on and said, 
Yeah, how's Lewis doing with Ocon? How about let me up there and take a poke at Ocon? You know, <laughs> he was mad he lost that position, so he yeah. was trying to get up there. Uh, he gave up in the end. They were, they did. were, there was no way Lewis was going to let that happen. No, and, and as cheeky as that was, the reality of it yeah. is George did pull out enough to cover his own penalty, so yeah, he ended up in P5, right? Um, so, yeah, I yeah. think if it was close for that, they may have done something on the last lap just to yeah. give, give him a shot. But yeah, in the end, Leclerc was fading anyway, so yeah. he he didn't. There was no necessity to do that. Yeah, he didn't need to. Uh, meanwhile, Lewis started on the medium, stopped for hards before the rain came out, and but he didn't lose anything uh, during the rain when he went to enter. So that was good, very much kind of like Alonso, didn't really lose a whole lot, lost a little time to Max, but he ended up ahead yeah. of the Ferraris in fourth, which is a really good result given that Mercedes brought all their new parts anyway. And mm -hmm. then we got to see a great picture of all of them on the crane, which I think Total Wolf said he didn't know. He, he reckons that the crane operator must work for Cirque du Soleil, you know, yeah. high wire act with their car. Well, that was when, when they were looking at Red Bull, right? Not when they were looking at... No, Mercedes too. Yeah. Oh, Mercedes was up there too? Yeah, they lifted Mercedes too. Oh, did they? Uh, oh, uh, really? When yeah. Lewis was... Oh, uh -huh. I see. Yeah, I gotcha. so everybody got to see <laughs> the underside of the Red Bull yeah. and the underside of Mercedes. Everyone got uh, to see everyone's naughty bits. I you. know. Yeah, yeah. And I got to tell you, Red Bull's naughty bits, <laughs> they looked amazing. <laughs> they did, yeah. They, I mean, you look at the underside of the Mercedes and got these fairings and, you know, yeah. they're controlling. You see, when you looked under the Red Bull, it looked like one of those geographic elevation maps, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. There was so yeah. much going on under there. It almost looked like the game Mousetrap, you know? It just had so much crap going yeah. on in there. Big, big sign, big signature, Adrian Newey. Adrian Newey yeah. over there, yeah. It was... <laughs> Yeah, it was uh, it was amazing. Yeah. But anyway, uh, yeah, it was a, it was a good race for Lewis. I mean, if you go back, they put all those new parts on, mm -hmm. a whole different side pod, a whole different floor. You got to think that car's going to feel a heck of a lot different than the last five races, right? Right. And and being Monaco, so I got to give kudos to the team for getting all those parts on that car and getting mm -hmm. both those cars tweaked and set up to at least put an effective pace and as such in the hands of both George and Lewis beat mm -hmm. both Ferraris who Red yeah. Bull had marked as the real threat here. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think they did a great job with the whole weekend. Really. Yeah. The call was pretty competitive. I think I'm really excited to see how well it's going to do at Barcelona's mm -hmm. the next one. Um, but yeah, Hamilton. Yeah. He didn't, he didn't lose any positions with a second pit stop because they, they ran the, uh, strategy perfectly when they put him out oh. when they yeah. made that pit stop for hards he was he had clean air oh yeah you know and he just banged it out and he had a lot of pace at that point because of that and, and he and set and he fast grabbed, lap yeah and that that was why when he had to pit for indus he he it wasn't it didn't send him to 10th or whatever because yeah. but then god knows what that pace what that strategy would have actually ended up him up being i think if it hadn't arranged i think he would have been the podium guy but um yeah i think lewis is you know, I know uh, drive of the race for F1 fans who voted for Espan very well deserved, but I think Lewis had a hell of a drive. He really he did. did. He and did. it was very quiet, and I don't think a lot of people noticed that, but he did have a great drive. Yeah, but as I said, I, th I think he was. Yeah, he did, but then he was also helped a lot by the by very good strategy by Mercedes. Yeah, now, yeah, where, yeah. Where, when to bring him in and send him out, as I said, it just makes such a difference to these cars. And we, we saw how much pace people lose when they're in traffic stuck behind yeah, yeah. someone's just a little bit off it's just very very difficult so kudos yeah, to all them. those people stacked up behind sergeant early on yeah you know, very, right right losing yeah second off the second it's gonna yeah, be so frustrating chunks yeah. of time you know yeah um let's talk about uh should we talk about ferrari no! let's talk about no, that it cannot be ricky i agree ricky um yeah. the long-suffering ferrari fan in me is hurt you had uh, Charlotte Claire in P6, Carlos Sainz in P8. Sainz looked competitive early on and started pressuring Ocon and then eventually ran into him, mm -hmm. uh, damaging his end plate. And it was really weird. You know, they just had made the call and he, and he looked like he had considerably more pace than Ocon. And yeah. as soon as they gave him the call, he just overcooked it, you know, in Nouvelle. And yeah. it was unfortunate. The end plate fell off. Then, Paul, it got into this weird Mobius loop at this point with Ferrari's strategy. So the wing's damaged, the end plate falls off. Mm -hmm. Luckily. The, yeah, luckily. because So the FI didn't mandate a pit stop. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so he's trundling out there, but then all of a sudden we go through multiple calls to box, no, stay out, box, no, stay out. <laughs> yeah. you could, it was almost like they were just sitting there with the calculator going, yes, box now. Yeah. Yeah. No, wait, was... wait, don't box, you know? Yeah. That's yeah. Carlos and... was like, Ricky, don't use my number. You know? <laughs> exactly. Like... It was like, wait a minute. So they got really wrapped around the axle trying to figure yeah. out when to box him and when not. Now you could spare a thought for the team and the strategist trying to figure this out. It would have been very difficult to do with that damaged wing. How much time are we losing? What's all the traffic? Is there a mm -hmm. gap? If we put him out, are we going to put him in traffic? The permutations are off the chart and, um, you know, it would have been tough. Now, when they finally did do it, Carlos is really mad because he yeah. thought <laughs> really uh, he go he went all Yuki on him, right? <laughs> oh, he, yeah. thought, <laughs> he thought that they could have got by Ocon had they got the strategy right. But in the harsh reality was Ocon was gone at that point mm -hmm. in time. They were really defending against Hamlin. So you have the team working a strategy to defend yeah. Well, what Carlos thought they should have been working on a strategy to undercut or overcut. Ocon, right, right. Yeah, he was, was like, I don't worry. Happen. Yeah, was like, I don't worry about the Hamilton guy. Yeah. 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 So very difficult time. You know, uh, you know, last year everybody kind of beat the crap out of our strategy. You know, rightfully so. I'd say this one. Yeah. You could wrap Not the so knuckles over either. this yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 if you're cool, making those calls to a driver, that is very disconcerting. You know. When we when you're out there on the street circuits, you're really trying to build up a rhythm, and everything needs to be calm mm -hmm. and collected. But getting the constant and getting ready to push to, for your in lap, and then don't push, then push. It's yeah, yeah. Not, not 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 a fun game, and it, it doesn't make you confident of what your team's doing back there. Sure. Was it a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, or last? I can't remember. Remember when when Ferrari was putting the strategy call to drivers. Well, what I don't know. What do you, what do you think we ought to do? <laughs> yeah, let me, let me call. Let me give let me give Charles a call, and I'll get back to you. We'll have a little chit chat. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, what the heck? I'm out here driving. You're the strategist. Tell me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can't see the whole race. Come yeah. on, man. Yeah. Uh, you know, for Charles, his day was basically hobbled on Saturday. Effectively, mm -hmm. he had that three place grid penalty, and I saw the replay of that. And it's a fair cop. I mean, yeah. I, I did think the FIA went out of their way to scold the team and shame mm -hmm. the team and their penalty mm -hmm. verbiage. I thought that was a little heavy handed, but anyway, whatever. Uh, so that kind of put pay to his, his, his race. Yeah, um, he played catch up for most of the day. Couldn't hold off the Mercedes. Uh, and it was pretty much done. I, you know, I'm thinking here's a strategy. Maybe they could hire Alpine's Laurent Rossi, the CEO, to have a few harsh words about his disappointment <laughs> yeah. with Ferrari, maybe that'll turn the team around like it seemingly has yeah. with Alpine. You know? Come in the room, beat a couple of them up. See, you want some of this? Are you gonna ship up or shape yeah. out, folks? Yeah. I'm kind of curious now, and you know, I'm just gonna be a cheeky and a chippy Ferrari fan here, but I saw you know, during practice sessions and John Elkin, the CEO of Ferrari in there with his shirt on and his sweater tied around his neck. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there. Is this a McKinsey boy? Who is this guy? He looks like a <laughs> college guy. You yeah. Know, young guy. Boy. Yeah. yeah. I'm wondering how's the whole thing going with Ferrari right now? Not yeah. just the F1. I'm just kind of curious how the whole management decision-making is everything okay over there? Is anybody checked for yeah. a pulse? What's going on over well, there? Well, yeah. Well, as you know, I've worked with Ferrari in the past, and it's not surprising. That's all yeah. I can say. Yeah, and it yeah. doesn't. The DNA and the culture doesn't really change. Yeah. Apart from if you bring in a Frenchman, a German, uh, a New Zealander, <laughs> an Englishman. and an Englishman in to run the whole thing, yeah. then you get then you, then you win titles. <laughs> then you win titles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's right. That's that's, that's what right. needs to change. So. so yeah, you've worked with them <laughs> under the Montezemolo era. Yeah, as well yeah, as that... all the different managers, you know. Right, and uh, it was even one... Maurizio Rivabene. Yeah, who's the other guy before him though? Oh, uh, don't ask me that. Mar uh, Mariachi. No. Yeah, Mariachi. Yeah, because yeah. he was he was the North North American guy. Yes. Yeah, so he was at the North American races when I was there, and then uh, and then yeah, he was he was sent to F one and then sent to sent to yeah sent to remember... Siberia. Yeah. <laughs> 
He was, a, he a, was a scapegoat. He must yeah. have known he was a scapegoat from the day he walked into that thing. I know. Well, remember, we went. you and I were in Austin a couple of times. The first time was when he was there. And remember, yeah. we went to that barbecue, outdoor barbecue with Ferrari. Yeah. And they had the, the chair with the little sign that has his name on it out there by a campfire or something. It was really weird. Yeah. You were not going to look at it. Okay. And then, remember, when you and I went to uh, Mondial, Ferrari Mondial, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Down he, in Daytona. He held everything up. Uh, Riva Bene that? was there, right? Yeah. Yeah, and held everything up, and they we, had we the were, We were trying special. to break that world record with the, enough Ferraris on. Yeah. We, we all got all these Ferraris overheating on the track, waiting to go, <laughs> because they haven't showed up on time to wait yeah. for ceremonial flag it was ridiculous yeah we had to wait for them and we're all out there and i was you you hooked me up with the 458 <laughs> so i'm yeah. out there with a ferrari 458 waiting to go and uh and, and waiting waiting, and waiting, and waiting, and waiting all these ferraris are overheating the yeah. vintage ones right not yeah. my 458 and it was frustrated so as soon as they released yeah. them everyone just went <laughs> No. I know. And when and when you finally released them, because you were trying to orchestrate that whole parade lap, you know, when they finally released all those, what, yeah. 280 Ferraris yeah. or whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember coming up, getting out to the where you get back on the track, and they had a guy saying, he goes, go, go, go. You <laughs> yeah. know, you, we had to hustle and bah, get, bah, bah. I know. So, <laughs> so I cobbed the damn thing, and that Ferrari just <laughs> launched, man. I thought I was yeah. going to go all Catherine Leg there, you know, yeah. and it give it too much listen. welly and hit the pit wall. That was crazy. I was hauling ass. I think I scared your sister half to death. I'm sure. She, she, she's mouth. easily scared, my you, but <laughs> yeah. she'll never ride in the car with me again. But yeah, yeah it's, that was uh, crazy. Yeah, that, that, but that's kind of it works like it's that Ferrari. all the time. It yeah, it's, yeah Ferrari. It's, it's Ferrari. What yeah. are you going to do? I love you, Ferrari. Uh, you know, take yeah. it with a, you know, I'm just, uh, it, it's all meant with a little bonhomie. Yes. Yeah, there you go. Um, all right. Uh, McLaren, Lando Norris, P9, Oscar Piaster, P10. Looks like Zach may have chose the wrong race to attend this weekend <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, as both McLarens finished in the points this weekend in Monaco. Uh, I wasn't expecting that, if I'm honest. Mm. Uh, Lando had boxed for hards while Piastri stayed out. Uh, and he jumped Lando at that point. Uh, but when the rain came, Lando turned it on. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was flying at that point. He was like one of the fastest guys out there. Uh, made quick work of Piastri. Got back yeah. by him, got by Yuki, climbed up to ninth. Looked fantastic, if I'm honest. Uh, he said uh, that the stops for the hards... Cost him 20 seconds in that race. He thought he could wow. have been farther up. Yep. Mm. Um, and for Piastri, you know, he had a very good race, finishing yep. just behind his teammate, P10. First year, he's he's driven Monaco before, but first year with McLaren in F1. Uh, made the most of that hard compound, went long, uh, then went hard to intermediate. And uh, past Yuki too. Yuki was having issues, but uh, <laughs> yeah. He was having, yeah, he was having we all issues. heard those physical, issues. Physical, mental i know uh, and car issues yeah oh my gosh i mean yuki at this point he's like you know it's sad okay. hey. <laughs> that's like yuki man yeah it is um so well we'll get into yuki in a minute but anyway yeah, yeah. A, a good result for mclaren i i don't know if they were expecting it coming into this weekend i know yeah. i wasn't necessarily so good result yeah. now they brought upgrades too kind of similar to i think the they Sadies, did yeah yeah right? yeah yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah some teams maybe may have a delayed few. them some but Andrea the... Stella said that effectively coming out in Austria is effectively a completely B spec of this car. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Austria. Okay, yeah. interesting. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, I think the car was better, and Norris, even in practices, was showing signs that yeah. he was going to be pretty good around here. So I wasn't surprised after we'd watched the practices. Practices. Right? Maybe, yeah. maybe going in, you wouldn't have expected it. But so I think Norris had a great race, and may, yeah, maybe should have had more points than they ended up with but um, right. at least they ended up and piastri i think did a great job he was yeah even as good as norris was having a good weekend piastri was actually keeping him honest so yeah he was that mm-hmm. that's a big step when driving a full one car for the first time around monaco i think yeah after after polo you know and uh what's his face uh, uh one of the quests <laughs> uh, one of the what <laughs> what the Who's the the guy that wrecked at Indy 500 and then uh, Polo oh, blew it? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh Jesus, how do I not? Pro- now you got you got my brain. I know. Off. I just said it's the Swede, the Swede, the Swede. Yeah. Rehnquist. Yeah, Rosenquist. 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 That's, Rosenquist. It. That's it. yeah. It was a quist, but I couldn't remember which one it was. 
I'm yeah. not talking about the cereal. Um, yeah, well, so two yes. McLarens crashed, right? Yeah. Yes, in exactly. The, and and yeah. so I got to think after two McLarens crashed and blew, blew yeah. it there at the end, I got to think mm-hmm. Zach's pretty happy with his F1 team. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's talk about Alfa Romeo, Valtteri Bottas in P11, Joe Guan Yu, P13. Joe started on the softs, which was a bit of a gamble, to say the least, because he wasn't able to make up any positions at the start. So he boxed yeah. really quickly for hards and then had to try to run to the end on those. It may have worked had the rain not come out. I, th- that I think point. that was a good strategy if you're at the back. Yeah. It, it may not get you in the points, but it gets you further up the, up the finish positions, yeah. I think. If I was in the back two rows, that's whatever. I, I don't know if I'd gone for softs. Maybe. Why not? Yeah. But, uh, because you the, the key is to pit super early and, and, yeah. and get that track position and clean air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. which is what he did. Mm-hmm. And I and to to your point, I do think he would have been considerably it further up had the rain yeah. not come out and then prompted the additional stop. I think that may have worked for him. Anyway, uh, Botas was uh, very early on to the intermediate. So mm-hmm. yes, he made the right call to go to intermediate. He was really early on him, and that did launch him up the order. So it was a good call. But unfortunately, say he ran out of grip on those yeah. entries late in the race, and this left him clamoring for that final point, uh, mm-hmm. which he missed. Uh, Valtteri did say, though, the, I mean, the upside of this, he said that they brought some upgrades and he said the car felt quite a bit better. Uh, yeah. And so that's good news for them. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't a, not a lot to talk about with those nope. guys. Obviously, yeah. Just kind of mid pack, just fumbling around there. Yeah. Just f- fumble around. Just <laughs> nah, what around. you did today, just fumble around. <laughs> what are you doing? Huh? <laughs> just hanging around. <laughs> oh, I'm not watching too mustache. much TikTok. Yeah. Yes. Uh, let's see. Did, was that Alpha Tauri? No, this is doing Alpha Tauri. Let's do that. You had Nick DeVries, yeah. P12, Yuki, Sonoda, and P15. Yuki had a tough day. Let's give props first before I pick on him. But but the reality of it is he had a very good qualifying session. Yeah. Yep. He ran in ninth for most of the race. Uh, and the race was going well. He, he went from mediums to the intermediates, the right move at the right time. So you mm-hmm. would think, you know, this strategy is going to come out. He's going to be in P9. He's going to be in the points. Yeah. And uh, before the end of the race, though, he started suffering brake issues, brake wear issues, ran yeah. out of brakes before the end of the race. This dropped him down to P15. He was furious. A lot of swear words on the radio. And then he asked the team after they told him what brake setting to put it on. They, he said, what are you trying to kill me? Yes, Yuki, <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> what this team is trying to do. They yeah. literally are trying to kill you. They'll just say, try and hold him off, Yuki. He's like, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, right. what do you want me to what do? Trying to, trying like, to is this what you want? Yeah. It's, trying to kill me. No, he obviously hasn't changed. No, he hasn't. It's no. There's no place for that kind of reaction in a Formula One driver. I'm it's sorry. A, it's and I'm sure you'll back me up on as a sporting manager for a racing team that talks to your drivers a lot. I'm yeah. sure you'll agree with this. All of that is a galactic waste of energy and time to have those kind of conversations. Yeah. You've got conversation between teams and drivers has to be as efficient as humanly possible, you know, yeah. and has to convey message and relay in real time mm-hmm. to really work. Having all this, you're trying to kill me with the hell these breaks and then blah, blah, and all this outrage and red mist and emotion really yeah. is exhausting. And it doesn't yeah. serve a purpose, you know? No, it's only a negative drawer on the team. Yeah. Because he's, he's shouting down the microphone, not just at one person. He, the whole team is listening. The yeah. whole world is listening to him deriding is i mean it's just it's just so such a negative drain yeah. on everybody and it, it, you shouldn't be in that mindset driving a full one car i don't know now how it does it yeah um, right because you you cannot drive like with that mentality you need yeah. to be calm i get i get it that emotions occasionally come into it you know we, we all but in that moment yeah, way, way, way too far exaggerated. On these yeah, if you compare it like Max, he gets frustrated with tires, frustrated with the team if the, he thinks yeah. it's the wrong call. Lewis, very much the same. You know, guys, I think we left it too late. You know, right. I, I don't think we should have switched these tires. You know, he's upset, right? Right. And that's emotion. But they're relatively benign. They're relatively efficient. He's just registering. He, he's not happy. Fair yeah. enough. But the whole f bombing, you're trying to kill me, kind of crap. They're just yeah. Honestly, if I would, I would sit him out. I would say, dude. Yeah. I you want too. to drive? Be a Formula One car driver. Be a professional. Yeah. You go think it out, and we'll bring somebody else in for next yeah. race. Because I really, they, I really yeah. would too. Yeah. I, I just is France. I wouldn't want to hear all that crap. I, yeah. I, I would want my team to have to hear all that crap. Yeah. Even if he's a talented driver, there's a lot of talented drivers. Yeah, there is. Honestly, yeah. there's a yeah. lot of them out there. And, and I don't see Yuki as 
the next coming of Max Verstappen or Senna or anything. So no. kick him out, get another one. I'm, I'm, it, he's entertaining from the outside looking in, but from a person that's involved in the team, I would be livid with his reactions yeah, and, and what he says, and I, I would, would I would find a replacement. Uh, Nick said it was a very difficult race, and he was accused of going very slowly early on by those behind him. But um, but Paul, slow and steady, wins you the best result of the season so far, if you're Nick DeVries. Yeah. He finished in yeah. P12. Good on him. Um, Nick said that it was kind of weird. He said that he did str- he'd suffered a huge drop in pace early on, mm-hmm. and that's why everybody was queued up behind him, and, and he wasn't sure why that was. And he said then just magically, boom, the pace came back. Late yeah. in the race, and he did a lot better late in the race. Yeah, crazy. Yeah. Don't know what was going on there. You have to sit down and have a long talk with Franz <laughs> This Tuck. He decided to put the gas pedal all the way down. Oh, oh all the way. shift, use all the gears. Yeah, you that's know? what it was. Yeah. I thought maybe he asked the team if they were trying to kill him. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, let's, uh, let's well, he talk. He said, Yuki's chasing you. Yeah. What? Oh, don't do Yuki. <laughs> don't let him. Yeah. Don't take any cues from Yuki. I don't need to do another media day with Yuki. He makes yeah. he, he scares me. <laughs> <laughs> he looks at me really strange. <laughs> Yuki may blow up, you know. Yeah. And I, sometimes I'm I'm standing there, and all of a sudden Yuki's right behind me, just looking at me. <laughs> don't do not taunt Happy Fun Yuki. <laughs> yeah. Don't feed him off the midnight. Whatever you do. <laughs> Should Happy Fun Yuki start to glow? Back away from me, Happy Fun Yuki. Oh my gosh! All right, let's talk about Williams. <laughs> Uh, Williams, Alex Albon, P14, Logan Sargent, P18. Logan actually made a really good target in a game of target practice early (laughs) on. He became the target for Lance Stroll, who just ping-ponged his way around the entire race. And even Nico Hulkenberg mugged him on the opening Mm -hmm. lap. He boxed for hards and intended to go long and then boxed again because he had like a puncture on that. And um, then... He was gonna part. He was gonna. He was gonna box again. I think the original. He boxed the softs, didn't he? Well, yeah. Eventually, they put him on hards, and he was gonna go long, but then they put him on uh, another set of tires, and and they were the quality tires. That's all they had left. <laughs> okay. So they put him on quality tires, and that kind of paid. You know, uh, that was the rest. Of, you know, that was yeah. the rest of his race. But then they put him on softs, so he could learn about graining. So it really. Kind of, it kind of turned into a class a test session, huh? Yeah. So there's no, you know, this isn't, you know, class from home. This yeah. Is, you know, class time at, at work. Yeah. And, well, uh, I mean, it's it, they're wasted laps anyway, I guess, yeah. you know, if you can get yourself in that mindset, I think Sargent actually does a pretty decent job. So I, I get the yeah. point of trying to get, get him more experience because I think mm-hmm. they can get some decent results out of him. If you hadn't felt what graining feels like on an F1 tire on F1, yeah, what but I'd be surprised. Yeah, but I'd, I'd I'd be surprised he hasn't, because that's what know. testing I... and practices yeah, are for. Maybe. Yeah, right. And and Monaco, I wouldn't say would be a predictable graining versus yeah, some other right. tracks. But yeah, true. Oh. Whatever. Maybe they saw something we didn't. Yeah, I don't know. On the other side of the ground, Alex said it was a boring but tough race, and I and he was hoping to nab a point, but he didn't. Um, I was hoping he would nab a point. Because mm-hmm. um, he had a good qualifying, uh, but he didn't have the pace uh, to make anything happen in Monaco, and it's tough in reality to make anything happen in Monaco. And so yeah. it was a pretty tough race. Alex did say that the hard was so much better than the mediums, hmm. and that he said so much so you just wish you could just run the whole race on the hards. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. But uh, he was one of one of the ones that pitted early, no? Yeah, yeah. I think. But yeah, I, I thought I thought he might be able to get it in the points. I thought he's he's a pretty handy driver, and they've they've had too. found ways of getting it there. But yeah, didn't didn't work out. Yeah, yeah, they were going after DeVries. I mean, James Vell said uh, mm-hmm. during, during the race, he said, "Look, we'd love to have a point, but our target basically is DeVries and P12." So, mm-hmm. uh, so it was close to P14. Um, let's talk about Haas, Nico Hulkenberg, P17, Kevin Magnussen, and DNF. Hulk had a lunge at Sargent. That didn't work out well. Got a five-second penalty for his effort. He boxed immediately, but he didn't serve the penalty during that because the penalty hadn't been announced yet. So they didn't know they had that penalty when he boxed. 
and put on uh, tires. But then they stopped again for enters. And when they did that, apparently, I, w- I guess the team forgot that they had the penalty and they didn't serve it when he bought oh, for their enters. Wow. So that garnered him a 10 second penalty. So that oh, was his race. Gunther, what are you yeah, doing? Yeah, what's going on, Gunther? You yeah, knew you good. had that penalty. He was too busy signing autographs and stuff. I think he was. Yeah. Have you have you read chapter 12 in my book? It's, <laughs> it's quite entertaining. Uh, let's see. Kevin had contact with Stroll. He stayed out when the rain came in that didn't really work because he hit the wall at that same exact place that schumacher did all those years ago at roscoe's mm. uh when as he was trying to get back to the pits he got in the team retired the car uh so it wasn't a monaco to remember for the team which means no. they may want to take a very close look at what happened here so they could try to do better at hungary yeah it's a bit of a comedy of errors here i think for it the was. Haas team yeah it was indeed. The 150th Grand Prix. Yep. Not the way they wanted to celebrate it, for no. sure. All right, let's give out some awards. First award is Move of the Race. Get down. Oh, yes. All right, Paul. Um, I'm going to give it to everybody on Logan Sargent <laughs> because it's kind of entertaining. The poor guy <laughs> was a punching bag for everybody's pra- I know. Pra- Passing practice, basically. Yeah, they've they gone left, they've gone right, they're banging in the back. It was like, oh, know. and, and the, the commentators are getting very yeah. excited about this battle for 15th place. So, yeah. But poor, poor old uh, Sergeant, yeah, he was a bit of a punching bag, but it was, it was entertaining just to see the different places everyone was going to stuff him. Yeah, it was. <laughs> Although, you know, a good con- uh, contender for move there is Magnuson's move on Sargent down inside of Mirabeau. I thought. Was yeah, good. yeah, it was, was good. Good move. Uh, my uh, move of the race. I'm going to give a Red Bull strategy to cover Alonso. I thought they were put to the test here this weekend. Mm-hmm. I think Hannah and team did a marvelous job of really reading the tea leaves. I think Max did a great job of executing. Um, and so they did a great job of covering those possible mm-hmm. threats. And I think Christian said there were a couple of moments they were on the ropes. Yeah, uh, there and they navigated their way out of it. Uh, let's give out the donkey of the race. We'll do it live. Not good enough, damn it. Not good enough. All right, Paul, donkey uh, of the race. I'm gonna have to give it to Sergio. Mm. So yeah, it's kind Poor of more like Sergio. donkey of the weekend. I know. You, know? you like my face? You like it? No. No. Mm. From it insult to injury, was it was his weekend. Yeah. I'm giving it to Lance. I think he hit. Just about everything out there. Yeah, except the pace go, because that wasn't yep. out there. Considering that Alonzo was in P2, I think that was a, a poor showing. Mm-hmm. I know. Everybody's saying you're picking on Lance. I'm not trying to. He's the one that DNF'd. Um, so, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Don't blame it's me. Fault. It's not my fault he's crap. Yeah, it's yeah. not my fault he crashed and hit everybody <laughs> and ended up DNF and walking back. Um, all right, let's do Drive the Race. Get down. Down. Oh yeah, drive the race, Paul. Yeah, Who'd well, I think well, Monaco, you kind of got, got to take qualifying into account because it's a very important part of the race. It um, is. And either way, I was going to pick Ocon because I think he did a phenomenal job in qualifying and and held it up in the race, which is amazing. I'm very happy yeah. for him. Well, Paul, the entire world agrees with you because they gave That's him the driver first. driver of the race. So very ours good. is drive of the race, not driver. Of yeah. The race. Don't be confused. Right. Um, if I was doing a driver of the race versus drive this, um, yeah, I, I think Esteban is, is absolutely. It's a great pick. I could go with Esteban. I, you know, I'll do something different. I think Max had a great weekend all the way around. When truthfully, uh, I think this was probably the one race that they were really fearing. They didn't have an advantage on that. Yeah. They didn't have a clear, comprehensive advantage mm-hmm. on, and I think Max executed perfectly yep. all weekend long. Whereas Sergio did not, but Max did, um, and they needed that. So, that's my pick. All right, let's do some mailbag. You've got mail. Uh, Matt asked. Well, Matt gave me example. He had a friend uh, that worked for Alpine, and um, he gave a example about the cost cap and the impact mm-hmm. it has on teams and employees, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I won't go into the details out of um, uh, confidentiality about the person. I don't want to implicate anyone or yeah. anything or any team. 
Uh, but but it it made him wonder about cost cap impact on teams, employees, and people that work for teams, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And he said, you know, I, th I guess my question is, do you think more pressure will be put on staff to work longer hours, travel more for less money? And how is the sport going to look in 10 to 20 years if all these young people leave? Uh, mm -hmm. Would maybe a better solution have been to say that the team can only play maybe like 500 staff, et cetera? Point being, mm -hmm. you know, travel budgets all have to be cut salaries yeah. how many big bonuses are you going to be given out to people that do laminate in you know, lamination work of carbon fiber how many bonus right. you know what i'm saying it yeah. all has a big impact and if the team is working under a, a, a serious cost cap it would reduce a lot of big raises you know all those sort of things the salaries mm -hmm. all rolled into that how does that all work um and if it becomes sort of untenable for employees to be gone six, seven, eight, nine months out of the year traveling around the world, and there isn't a lot of upside and growth opportunity, right? You know, you do wonder how many people hang around. Yeah, it's it's that that's always been the bad side of the cap, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's the people. Yeah. Um, do you fire people? Do you pay people less? Do you work people longer? you do all of the above yeah uh and, and it's a different balance to have and and to to fix that you need to stop the teams from hurting themselves i suppose mm -hmm. manage you know maybe it's about managing how many people go to a race rather than how many people you employ right right so you can have you can it, with with as many 16 races used to be the max now we're like 23 24 yeah. we always seem to cancel one of them but whatever they're always striving for um back when you didn't when you had open budgets you actually had sometimes two teams that were right. going back and forth right so those people weren't on the road all the time one team was back doing taking care of their cars and vice right. versa when you had test teams and all this stuff yeah um, that's the only way i feel they could control themselves is by limiting how many people can actually go there so you can keep people back and as i said have them sub in and rotate. sub out. Yeah, rotate through because it's it's a grind. It's you know I, mm -hmm. I don't know how many races I'm going to this year. I think it's maybe seventeen, eighteen. It it's it's a lot. You know you love it because yeah. it's a passion. The passion drives you and keeps you going. Yeah. And a lot of people don't necessarily get paid a ton of money to be in Formula One, but they're there because of the passion. They want to be at the pinnacle of the sport. Right. And they and Formula One teams take advantage of that a little bit right yeah um because you, you come away with a formula one pedigree as a mechanic that opens some doors for you in other things that you want to do but yeah i, I feel like the only way to control it is to control what's at the track because we know you don't necessarily need 12 14 people changing tires you could change that um yeah. and then you could use those personnel you're not bringing to every track to as i said to to maybe give people time off or switch between races that kind of thing and because it 20 something races formula one is it's a pretty intense sport and and labor intensive and it, it will burn a lot of people out now that it wouldn't have in the past just because the the you know how many races we we're actually doing so yeah yeah and it's all you know it's not i think you're to your point you know it's formula one for sure with mm -hmm. the cost cap but even at emsa paul all those teams that you race against they've all got budgets yep yeah everyone and those, everyone and, lives and in the limited budget. resources right so yep. there's only so much you can do i i guarantee you you would you and ian would probably love it if you could be double the head count you guys are now oh um, i don't know about that <laughs> you love magic people <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we've got but, the right uh, amount of people but yeah but you know but if you I mean, had operation a much bigger operation more people, yeah. and engineers and yeah. you know you'd love to have that but everybody's got a budget you got to work within and it's yeah. tough yeah and then like the budget it's like when you're on the road the you know certain they have to share rooms yeah right. so you don't have your own privacy and you you know, I, I I always take my I pack my bag thinking I'm going to go to dinner every night, and I never do. I yeah. never unpack those clothes. I'm in my team gear when I go to the track, and I come back late at night and I go to bed, and that's yeah, it. Yeah, right. I, right. This grandiose, and that's you know the mechanics. Yeah, everyone's the same, same way. Thing. You just to the track first thing in the morning. You're back. You know, if you, hopefully you can grab dinner not at the track. Yeah. But most of the times you're grabbing it at the track, and all you literally do is drive to and from the hotel, sleep, get up, have a shower. 
you know so it is a right. grind you know it is yeah it is. it is yeah yeah good question matt uh me asked when was the last time a car ended up in the harbor at monaco mm. after seeing the pictures of hamilton's car being hoisted high in the air on social media i did wonder briefly if it had been hauled out of the water <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah that's a great question the only ones i can think of uh me is ascari in in 1955 and then in a decade later paul hawkins went into the drink in 65 um, oddly enough, Paul, both those drivers died soon after that incident where wow. they went into the harbor. Uh, Ascari at Monza and uh, Paul Hawkins died at Olton Park mm. in a T70 Lotus. Wow, T70 Lotus. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there you go. But uh, anyway, those Lola, are the you only... mean? T70 Lotus? Uh, Lola, I'm sorry. T70. Yeah. Did I say Lotus? Lola. Yeah, Lotus. Yes. Yeah. T70 Lola. Yeah. Um, Beautiful car. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, well, those are the only two that come to mind. If yeah, I'm I don't forgetting know. somebody. Like I, most, I think I think a few of them went in the and went in the drink in the filming of Grand Prix, but there was no one in them. So right, they, these are those catapults. To... They shoot the catapult over the hay yeah. at Portier, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe that's why I have such a love of Portier. And now <laughs> they've kind of ruined it because they've reclaimed a bunch of land behind it, and there's all these high-rise buildings. Yeah, 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 buildings and stuff. And it's unfortunate. I hated it even before the buildings were there. They put all the hoardings up there, and you couldn't see the ocean yeah. you know, when you come around. So it's frustrating so but i still love portier all yeah. right well that does it for this race but we got to come right back at it paul you do yeah because we got the uh spanish grand prix right spanish um, grand prix is next weekend is it oh is it going to be yeah that was going to be the triple header it turned into a double header yeah, right. it turned into a double okay. so we got yeah that's exactly or you know where we're going Barcelona! yes we're yeah. going to spain next week so we'll be back to do it all again paul yeah, I'm trying I'm thinking, to think. I'm... Am I going to be out of town? Where I am. Be? I'm on my way to Le Mans, actually. Are you? <laughs> Next uh -oh. Monday. Uh -oh. Yeah, we might have to do it right after the race. We'll may do it. have to do another Sunday show. Yeah, may have yeah. to. Yeah. yeah. But everybody, again, Paul's going to Le Mans. Yeah. The team is going to Le Mans. Yes. You got to watch. Got to going to cheer for that 23 and 27. Is it just 23? Just, just uh, it's, it's 98. 98 over there because we okay. yeah we had to we took someone else's slot and their number is 98 and oh, you know, okay. fia they're not going to yeah. budge or change oh, anything no. so you know we're 98 no. in that car for the rest of the year eddie everywhere is a bear for detail <laughs> yeah. yeah what would happen if you change the number i don't yeah. know but yeah, evidently you can't so mm. in Le Mans, you're going to be cheering for number 98 mm -hmm. there you go all right yep. so all right well until next week let us know what you think about the monaco grand prix you can do that by going to the park for may.com share your opinion just do it to conform civility as always if you like the podcast then you can go over and give us a uh, a really good rating at apple music or your favorite podcast mm -hmm. uh, player that would be awesome uh, i put Super our new awesome. logo uh wear up at the website a huge thank you to our patreon supporters because we could not and would not do this podcast without you so incredibly grateful for your support and you can support us by going to the part from a.com and on the right hand side it says support us you click on that or at the bottom left of the website click mm -hmm. on that and that would be awesome and until next week, possibly on Sunday, when we awesome. review the Spanish Grand Prix, we'll come back and do it all over again. Until that time, this is Todd, a.k.a. Negative Camber, saying so long. That's it, man. Game over, man. It's game over.